So what about dealing with the world of officialdom? I mean, most of us feel a tremendous sense of freedom when we start living on a boat, but nobody can completely escape officialdom in its many and varied forms. And the reality is we no longer fit the template that governments and councils, banks, understand and can cope with. Now, we have some liverboard friends who delight in telling every curious gongoozler, that's what boaters called land-based spectators, we're water gypsies. It's an interesting experiment in perception and prejudice and quickly shows which individuals feel gypsies or any sort of travelling people are to be envied and which feel instinctive dislike for those outside the system. The score so far is about 80% envy and 20% prejudice. They get great amusement from it, but it holds a kernel of truth as we can easily be treated as officially homeless when we try to access those bits of society we need. Try getting a vote or a bus pass as a continuous cruiser and you'll soon find you need to declare yourself of no fixed abode. There are some parts of officialdom that cannot be easily ignored by the liverboard boater, while others appear to be an optional extra. Note I say easily ignored because there appear to be boats that get away with simply not bothering to abide by any of the rules. Yeah, but if you're not one of them and you need to ensure your boat has a boat safety certificate, a CRT license or one from the managers of your particular waterways and insurance, Actually getting hold of such things can pose a problem. Almost all of Britain's waterways are run by three main organisations, each of which, which issues its own licences and registrations. Canal and River Trust runs almost all the canals and rivers such as the Severn, Trent and Yorkshire Roos. The Environment Agency runs the River Thames, the River Medway and the rivers of East Anglia. The Broads Authority uh, runs the Norfolk and Suffolk Broads. All of them require boats to have a valid boat safety scheme certificate or a declaration of conformity with the Recreational Craft, uh, Recreational Craft Directive. Getting a BSS certificate is simple if somewhat expensive. It's a sort of MOT where the examiner turns up at your boat pokes his head into various nooks and crannies and then says you've passed or you need to make certain changes to get a certificate. You send a copy of the certificate off to your navigation authority uh, and they should then not need to ask you for it next uh, for the next four years or it's registered um, electronically with them and uh, they automatically know you've got it. Um, that's true certainly of, of Canal and River Trust. Now most of those navigation authorities will also insist on third party insurance for at least a million pounds. This will safeguard the owner or the person in charge of the boat from claims made against you for injury or damage. Of course you will probably also choose to take out a, a comprehensive policy to cover your own boat and crew Canal and River Trust used to insist that you sent them documentary proof of third party cover, but they no longer do so, saying they do spot checks to ensure owners are not uh, telling them lies. Now, as someone who's been hit by an uninsured boater, I wish they were slightly more stringent. If you have a home mooring, see in, uh, see Canal and River Trust will ask where it is and say that if you don't have one you should tell them you are a continuous cruiser so that they can endorse your license and note it on their computer system. Once you've accepted that label you make yourself more of a target for officialdom as Canal and River Trust is currently uh, getting into a lather about the number of continuous cruisers who do not in their view cruise far enough or often enough. It's won a minor civil case uh, against a boat on the Ken Navan, but the scope of its real powers has yet to be tested in a higher court. And there's a major debate going on in London as CRT tries to uh, cleanse it of liverboard boaters around uh, various parts of uh, the centre of the city. So dealing with the waterways own officialdom is unavoidable, 
but relatively simple if you keep to the rules. Uh, we've never been told we've, uh, we've never been told we've stayed too long on a mooring in 19 years, and we've always kept our boats tested and insured as well as licensed. And Canaan River Trust has proven to be fairly easy to deal with, fairly helpful with the documentation, but rarely swift. My best advice is to give any navigation authority plenty of time plenty of time to respond. And of course CRT is also the Liverpool's local authority. Just like you ring the council when a street light goes out or there's a pothole outside your door deep enough to bury the dog, you need to contact CRT to tell them of obstructions in the canal, damaged locks and other threats to your ability to move around. The system is uh, somewhat flawed by the use of a of a call centre, um, but most of it is now done online with uh, Twitter. Um, you'll find yourself sometimes speaking quite slowly and clearly and repeating yourself several times uh, as they try to work out which canal you're talking about. Be patient and eventually you'll get a call back from a CRT worker who actually does know the canal and will get the problem sorted. And finally there's the uh, thorny topic of red diesel. All boats on the canals used to be able to run on red diesel which didn't attract the same levels of tax and duty as road diesel. Just like farmers and domestic users of heating oil which is basically the same stuff. Um, then the European Union decided that diesel used on pleasure boats for propulsion had to be taxed in the same way as road diesel. After a lot of discussion Revenue and customs in this country came up with a solution. Boaters would pay the full rate for diesel they used purely to move the boat about and any to use to generate electricity, heat the boat and run a diesel stove for instance would be domestic and available at the lower rate. In that guidance they said it was the boaters right to self-declare what proportion of any fuel they were buying was to be used for propulsion. On leisure boats, the split might be 60-40, but it was also accepted that liverboard boats who stayed in one area were entitled to claim 100% domestic. Now that decision is currently again under question, and it won't be changed by Brexit, I don't think. Um, but it's uh, yet to be seen whether uh, protests and lobbies from the residential boat owners and the IWA make any difference and whether we have to end up paying the full white diesel price in months and years to come. In any event, it'll take some time to, uh, uh, for it to take effect. I mean, we estimate 90% uh, domestic and about 10% travel over a year in fact, of course, HMRC don't even have enough inspectors to investigate the multi-millionaire tax avoiders, as it seems unlikely they're going to interest themselves much in uh, diesel sellers who uh, fiddle their declarations or um, boaters who make a, many, a genuine mistake and may overclaim. So now, can you, you can ignore the rest of the official world, right? Well, sort of. You can ignore them until you want something from them, a vote, a medical checkup, a bus pass. If you live on a residential mooring and it's a fixed position with planning permission from the local council, the odds are you'll be asked to pay council tax. Interesting, the um, marina firm formerly owned by Canal and River Trust applied for and got what amounts to retrospective planning permission for residential moorings on a lot of its marinas. Um, it's, it has long sold what it called class one berths that were in effect residential but without planning permission. And although some local councils have tried to impose council tax, they've usually failed because the marina reserved the right to move the boats about so they couldn't be regarded as fixed abodes. Once they had the planning permission, Canal and River Trust seemed to have decided that uh, they would just accept that Liverboard should pay the tax and they're trying to negotiate a different rate. That's been achieved at marinas like Mercia. 
And of course, having an official presence in the area, there can be benefits as well as the penalty of paying council tax. If you're a, a resident, you're entitled to claim housing benefit and, uh, for the mooring fees and perhaps the licence. Um, that can be much more difficult, or not, if not impossible, for those uh, on moorings without planning permission. And uh, you don't have to be squeezed by the recession, of course, to have to want to take up your right to vote or get a bus pass or find a GP. Um, if you have a marina that accepts your post, that's not too difficult, but uh, most local authorities will allow you to register to, to vote. Um, um, but the electoral officials take varying views, some just registered like any other voter, others we had to declare an affinity with the area, like a homeless person. Doctors will usually accept a marina address and if you're on the electoral register you can usually get a bus pass when the time comes. If you're on the move though, life gets more complicated. Some official bodies, like Revenue and Customs and the Department for Work and Pensions will be reasonably happily, happy to communicate with you through a family member's address. Although we tell them we don't really live there um, and explain the situation. And even if we suspect they don't listen, but if you, you can't do that, then they will use a post restaurant address at a convenient local post office. Although. If you were constantly travelling the country, you'd have to notify them of a new address every time you entered a new area. We operate a sort of compromise. Government stuff goes through a family address, but when we want a GP, dentist, vote or bus pass, we take the local option. We know that although we travel constantly, we will be limited to a certain area of canals in winter by both the stoppages programme and the weather. We find a central location we can access by, access by bus from various parts of the canal and register there with a doctor using the main post office as a post restaurant address. Most GPs and dentists will be happy enough with that and the better ones can be persuaded to ring you for anything urgent. The same address will serve to go on the electoral register, albeit as a homeless person, and even to claim your bus pass. In the end, you become sort of semi-detached from all that officialdom. And you simply swap one set of bureaucrats from another when you move on. Uh, we hang on to our winter GP until we settle on an area for the following winter. And uh, we're currently lucky enough to have one where we can post them our repeat prescriptions along with a stamped envelope addressed to a post office on our route. You know, as we get older, we tend to appreciate a system that, at present anyway, allows us to utilise the benefits of the welfare state without having to stay in one place. Younger people will find a very different experience, I know. <laughs>